coming back to this Asia-Europe meeting arrangement, which basically is a, a summit every two years, a foreign minister's meeting every in the intervening year, half a dozen ministerials and 50 or 60 events at sectoral level over the last, every year, over the last uh, 96 to now, 15 years, this has grown like topsy in terms of the number of sectors uh, discussed and the number of countries involved. And then in 2009-10, Russia and Australia, and then 2010, New Zealand applied to enter this, all on the Asian side. Now, for reasons which were, I think it's not really a secret, the Asian, some Asian partners had a doubt about Russia being on their side, so they decided to create a third grouping, a temporary grouping. And Australia, New Zealand, and Russia are in this temporary grouping, but it doesn't actually make a big difference to their benefits from this process. But I think it's an interesting point to end on because, you know, why did Australia, New Zealand apply to do this? Why did Australia apply to do this? Are you Asian now? Are you, you want to be more European? You want to be more Asian? Are you still Pacific? You know, what is New Zealand's um, commitment to dealing with Europe and the rest of Asia? ASEM didn't have that delivery aim, but it did include not just economic and finance, but social and cultural, and political affairs. Nothing was excluded. Also, it has a structure. Everybody's there. You have the summits, you have the foreign ministers' meetings, you have three or four senior officials' meetings every year. But the, you can then come up with almost anything else, climate change, uh, food labeling, uh, you know, agricultural policy, uh, immigration processing, uh, 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 interfaith dialogue, uh, uh, culture and civilizations, uh, employment legislation, uh, 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 environmental standards, all these kinds of things. So it's basically like a supermarket in the sense that those initiatives normally are in the ASEM process are driven by some countries on each side, maybe the European Commission also in Europe, but it doesn't have to be all the members. All the members are invited. Normally all the members turn up and you can host. Normally the real financier of an event is the host and another partner on the other side. And the rest of the costs are basically the visit, the airfares and the time of the people, you know, like me here now. Um, but basically you can, it's like a, a, a shopping list. I mean, so New, what New Zealand needs to do now that it's in ASEM is to look at all the, look at its relations with Europe and Asia and consider what is an area where you think in terms of persuading Asian and European partners. Because don't forget, it's a way of projecting your, your approach also to your Asian friends um, to, and to Europeans. You know, what issues are important to your country? You know, is it um, uh, climate change? Is it uh, food labeling? Is it you know, financial markets? I mean, probably you're not a global leader in financial markets, but you know, is it, is it you know, We've had a very heavy discussion about um, uh, education policies for um, many year Asian partners are very interested. And we've had two ministerials about um, university curricula. You know, I don't know whether you know that Europe has had a sort of process of not harmonization, but the, through the Bologna process to have, you can now have a similar curriculum across Europe so you can transfer around. And that means you can use Erasmus. You know, and Asian partners led by the Koreans have, in, have invented something called Duo, which is a bit a sort of Asian Erasmus inside Asia. Now that's an example. Right? So basically, New Zealand can decide you know whatever it wants to do. When I was in Canberra last week, the Australians came up with one initiative that they wished to lead, which is actually built on previous initiatives. There have been initiatives on cross-border. Um, contagious diseases, um, which the European Commission particularly supports also on SARS, avian flu, whatever. But um, there are, these can either be more specific regulatory things or more of a policy thing. Quite often, the things that come up in the ASEM process are, are sort of global issues which are coming onto the agenda before global structures get created. Um, the summit in 2008 in Beijing was about six weeks before the first G20 in Washington, D.C. And the Chinese hosts and the French, who were in the president of the European Union, and the Commission very much tweaked the agenda of that summit to make it really a brainstorm yeah, about what we're going to agree in the G20. The world was in a spin. Lehman Brothers blown away. Exchange rates and markets were frozen. 
blowing about. And, so, and then you had uh, 48 heads of state and government meeting in Beijing, including you know, about 13 members of the G20. A lot of you have never been to a G20. Indonesia, Thailand, people like that, Australia, they hadn't been to one of those. They weren't G8s. So, and that was a very useful summit from that, but you can have different levels of summit. Sometimes then these initiatives, they lead to a good exchange of views. You don't have a repeat. Sometimes they lead to an annual agreement. Now we have every year the Directors General of Immigration have a long, and I'm sure incredibly boring, but very important meeting about immigration procedures, documents, fraud, electronic visas, all that kind of stuff, you know, and they exchange views. This is, this is a useful process, you know. So New Zealand can think about, you know, what specific things. You also, I'm not sure that you've net yet done your thinking, either you individuals here or even in Wellington, your government people, about, you know, strategically, and I don't think it's something you're going to decide tomorrow, you know, what is your position in the world? I mean, you're right on the right-hand side at the bottom, as you know. And you, when I was talking with your more junior colleagues yesterday, I was very entertained when we started talking about identity and things, because one of the students said, well, we are Commonwealth first. And I was completely surprised by that. I said, what, Commonwealth? Oh, yes. Commonwealth, yeah. It's a, I thought it was very interesting. So, I mean, I think it's... Another, the last thing I'd point I'd make about the ASEAN process, which is actually a real value, and that's something about the European Union for us as well in general, is it puts you onto an equal footing with China and India and Asia, with Germany and the UK. You know, you get a similar, you can host something, you know, if you want to host a summit, if you want to host a foreign minister, if you want to host a whole meeting about, you know, food labelling or something like that, you can do that. You get, you get to speak. You get to see the big boys, you know, talking. So it's one way that you lever small and medium-sized countries into these global dialogues. And there are a lot of these track two processes around the world. You know, it's not just the UN with 193 in the General Assembly. 